So, thank you for this uh, wonderful lecture. Um, not only it was very interesting, but um, it gave us different uh, plans to maybe change a little bit the behavior of uh, our society. Um, I'm thinking particularly to prevention. You, you spoke about prevention. So we know, for instance, today as a media person, that medias are not very fond of tensions in the world and in countries, and they're much more interested by bloody conflicts. And even in the UN system, we see that a department like the Department of Political Affairs that is uh, taking care of prevention has only a budget of something like $8 million when DPKO, the department taking care of ongoing conflicts has a budget of maybe something like 80, 81 or 82 billion dollars. So I, I would like you to, to explain us a little bit more about what you, you think about prevention and when you look at the conflicts, the ongoing conflicts, uh, particularly in um, Africa, you have CAR, Central African Republic, you have South Sudan, you had Mali, you have in other countries like Syria. Uh, yesterday we had the High Commissioner of uh, um, um, Refugees, Mr. Guterres, that came with Jan Eglin to um, give us the new figures of IDPs, internal displaced people, and it's awful, it's something like 33 million uh, internal displaced people uh, during the at the end of 2013. So, do you think that first of all, Guinea-Bissau is maybe a good uh, example of prevention? Uh, that the other crisis could have been prevented. I'm thinking particularly to CAR, Central Africa uh, African Republic. Uh, yes, uh, certainly. Uh, there are situations where uh, very early uh, intervention by the UN, and intervention, I don't mean uh, forceful arm intervention, uh, efforts at uh, helping mediation, uh, could uh, have uh, prevented uh, uh, conflict from exacerbating. Obviously, as I mentioned in my written remarks, uh, you cannot go into a country. There is a couple right now in uh, Southeast Asia that would be very uh, uh, benefit a lot from a active, uh, proactive uh, uh, external uh, mediation. Uh, but these two countries, from my experience, uh, extremely proud. Uh, they always tell you, we can resolve this problem. And everybody knows they are not resolving the problem. Uh, and so you always run against uh, pride. I have to say, you know, uh, when I was prime minister in my own country, during the crisis of 2006, there were some hesitation about requesting international assistance. Some people said we can manage it. Uh, because after the UN departure, Timor Leste was independent, and it was embarrassing for, again, Timor Leste to ask uh, for uh, international assistance. In the end, we ask again to Portugal, Australia, New Zealand, and Malaysia. Therefore, promptly helped. We didn't wait for the UN because Security Council was studying, considering, so we went for more practical uh, uh, help. Uh, Portugal, in a matter of days, from 20,000 miles away, had more than 100 well-trained uh, riot police landing there. But then, we, uh, uh, these same forces then later moved into uh, Portugal and Malaysia, moving under the UN uh, command by August. Speaking to our national parliament, I said, my responsibility as prime minister is to ensure safety, tranquility to every family in this country. 
If I cannot do it with our own means, it is my responsibility to ask international assistance. Pride cannot come in the way of our obligation of protecting people. So we accepted four forces came, four countries, and then we have a larger UN force that came, uh, I think 1,500 police force, left only, finally, August uh, 31st, December 2013. As I promised the Security Council, I went to the Security Council in May 5th, I addressed Security Council, May 5th, 2006. Uh, I tell you, it was not my proudest moment to go there to ask again for assistance. They responded positively. But I also told the Security Council, it cannot be again one year, two year short missions. I was advised by specialists in the Secretariat, don't talk about five years, you will scare them away. I said, no, I will talk about five years. In the end, we prevailed. The UN mission was there for five years, and I promised Security Council. By the end of the fifth year, I will not come again to ask for extension. If I have to do it, and I said it in, on the floor of Security Council, you issue a certificate of incompetence to all of us Timorese political leaders. Because we cannot always keep blaming the international community. Who is to blame for the failure in Afghanistan? You keep blaming the Americans, NATO, the UN, or the inability of national leaders to make use of the space created by the president of the international community to engage in dialogue. That's what we did in those years that I was around. And, uh, well, you mentioned about the media. Yes, the international community, countries, react like media. Journalists, as you mentioned yourself, react to earthquakes or to wars, not to silent conflicts or not to development challenges. Yes, once in a while you have a, a journalist do in-depth coverage of some development uh, strategy. But governments do the same. Governments also react to earthquakes and to uh, uh, wars. Uh, so that's why peacekeeping, DPKO has a huge budget, and the prime United Nations body, DPA, which is the prime uh, prevent diplomacy tool, is very little resource. If DPA were to have a 10 times more budget to hire people from around the world with different expertise from A to Z, deploy to key regions, key countries, in a discreet manner, can be under the cover of UNDP, but they are specialists in early warning, in mediation. And uh, because by very nature, it should not be advertised anyway. But they cannot do that because they don't have resources. And um, so it is not the fault of UN as such. It's the fault of member states. Okay, member states. So if we take, for instance, CAR, Central African Republic, it's clear that uh, it has been years uh, that the appeals from OCHA uh, have been very uh, little uh, funded. We've seen 3%, 5%. So when the situation, the bloody situation exploded, now everybody seems uh, a little bit uh, scared about how things are, are changing. But I'm, I'm thinking about Ukraine. I know that you, you're following the events in Ukraine for a long time. And you spoke about pride, having the humility to ask help of the international, um, the international community and also maybe look for a mediator. So do you think that um, in Ukraine, so give us your, your um, advices about Ukraine, your opinion about it, and also if you think that OSCE could help out. I don't know whether OSCE is a neutral party to the Ukraine uh, uh, conflict and uh, an empire collapse by will of people, maybe by the will of John Paul II and Reagan, you know, depends how you interpret the events at the time, what brought about the end of the Soviet Union. Very proud people. 
they found themselves confined in a smaller territory. Not so small, but smaller than uh, before, with less people. What should the other side have done? They did the opposite. Instead of reconfigure NATO for post-Cold War, they found other reasons to expand NATO towards the borders of uh, the former Soviet Union. Well, remember the missile crisis with Cuba. Why it happened? Because the Russians moved missiles closer to the United States. So that's one. It's different when you invite Ukraine or other country to join the European Union. But to expand NATO uh, towards the borders of uh, Russia, uh, and then, but of course you understand also <laughs> the leaders of former uh, Soviet Union. They live 50 years under uh, Soviet Union, and they wouldn't trust uh, the post-Soviet uh, Union. So they seek international uh, alignments in order to protect them for any unforeseen event. Well, that's when diplomacy comes about, creativity, to see how you can balance all these interests without upsetting the giant neighbor that had been wounded in its pride from the collapse of the empire. In Ukraine, when I think there can be uh, preventive diplomacy, it's still time. I believe that there are rational people in uh, Kiev, in Moscow, in Europe. There are, you hear some rational voices in Europe. And I believe that it's no cause for alarm. And uh, there should be active uh, mediation, maybe by Germany in combination with Norway, uh, to find way out for uh, everybody. Norwegians, a small country, but they are uh, trusted by usually everybody. Uh, Germany have a strong ties with the United States, within Europe, obviously, and with Russia. So they, I believe, uh, they are trusted by Moscow. And uh, so it's possible, you know, I wouldn't see it in panicking about the situation. I would prefer to see the tragedy is that attention is diverted uh, uh, from uh, Syria to Ukraine. A far greater tragedy is still ongoing, no solution in sight. And there is very uh, little hope now that first Kofi Annan and then Lakda Brahimi gave up. <laughs> Who else can do that? After the two, as the French Leroy said, après moi les déluges. After Ban Ki-moon, after Kofi Annan and Lakda Brahimi, what? So, but, uh, and that is an uh, indictment of all of us, indictment of the international community. But in, of obviously, number one priority, uh, responsible is President Assad. Uh, but those also underestimated him. Yeah, and, and also, uh, you were talking about powers, uh, countries that have an influence. We know that uh, one of the elements is the fact that you should have all the actors of that conflict around the same table, included President Assad. Do you think that Iran has to sit also around this table? Um, so could you share with us uh, your uh, voice, uh, your point For of whatever it's worth, my opinion, I'm a small person from a small country, from a forgotten UN outpost in West Africa. <laughs> if my opinion helps, yes, Iran should be brought to the uh, talks. And, uh, and uh, we cannot always demonize the other side. Uh, I never been to Iran, so I cannot, but uh, you have to acknowledge uh, steps the other side taking and encourage them to take further steps. And the only way is to incentive and give them a way out. And I'm not naive. I'm 64 years old. Actually, sorry, I'm 44 years old. <laughs> and uh, um, so I'm not naive, you know, um, but uh, it is, uh, you have uh, no other solution. You know, Iran would have, was helpful in Afghanistan, with Afghanistan 10 years ago. 
Uh, but there were internal uh, debates in, in, in Washington itself, and the one side prevailed uh, against the uh, Iran role in uh, Afghanistan. So it is a mistake. And uh, So do you think also that the fact that the international community, part of the international community, are in a certain way hiding behind the veto of China and Russia is also a behavior that is a little bit easy because if tomorrow China and Russia don't put their v a veto, what is going to happen? Is Europe uh, and the United States going to, to react, the European community? Well, I personally, uh, again, observing from uh, afar, uh, I wouldn't to criticize U.S. and European prudence in dealing with uh, the situation in Syria. If we talk about uh, Russia and Chinese veto of a Chapter 7 or an intervention, uh, I'm glad that uh, Russia and China would veto something like that. And I don't think the U.S. or the Europeans were thinking along that line anyway. Uh, or I would say that uh, uh, one day we might even thank Russia and China for not allowing the U.N. to get bogged down in Syria. Uh, so it's too simplistic to put the blame for your Security Council inaction on Russia and uh, China. Uh, it would have been uh, easier three years ago. Uh, we know the nature of Assad regime, a minority regime of an ethnic group, a siege mentality, etc., etc. We know all of that. No need to convince anyone about the nature of the regime. So the position was right, obviously, like everywhere, to demonstrate to demand changes. But the problem in Syria, like it was in Libya, in many other situations, because of the nature of the situation there for decades, there was not a national movement that emerged steadily, consistently over the years, gaining experience. Like us, it took us 24 years. At the end of 24 years of occupation, we knew all about politics, about international negotiations, about the international system. We knew about the other side. We knew how to, uh, even the smallest, the smallest concessions that the Portuguese extracted, the UN extracted from Indonesia, we would embrace. Yeah, that's fine. Even, it sounds ridiculous. But we wouldn't give a chance to Indonesia to walk away from the negotiating table. And the Indonesians were looking for a way to get out. Because the UN, and that shows that the patient diplomacy carried out by many in the UN over the years. First, it was when Kofi Annan came into office, he didn't consult with Indonesia. He said, I appoint a special representative for East Timor, a special envoy. A special envoy, you don't have to consult. Bhutus Ghali, before him, had consulted, and he uh, said, no, you, you continue to do it yourself. We don't need any special uh, representative. Kofi Annan, smarter, said no, he appointed. And slowly, very painfully, painstakingly, some very, very little steps at a time. And we seize every wind of opportunity. And uh, I met with the Indonesia Foreign Minister, Ali Alatas, in New York at Waldorf Astoria, uh, organized by the UN, that was in 94, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The Syrian opposition, I wrote something for a um, Daily Beast or Huffington Post, I don't remember which one, I was asked to write, share our experience. I said to the opposition, work with an non-plan, seize an opportunity, get yourself into the negotiating process, don't get out of it. Of course it's risky, dangerous, you will be assassinated, of course, but you know, there are many more dangerous situations than that. So, but they, what they did, demand, precondition was Hassad resignation. Well, if you defeat militarily in the field, once, then you can, yes, impose an ultimatum, you surrender. 
But he was just beginning and he was the other side with a powerful conventional army, air force, to surrender well. Uh, it's not uh, the most, the wisest move. So we lost that chance. And everything else after that became more complicated. You, you still think that we have, uh, there's this, there is a possibility to walk out and to find a solution for, for Syria? Because uh, it's not only the problem of Syria, it's also the problem of the neighboring countries, the region. There are so many refugees that it, it starts to really be tough for the, the surrounding countries, particularly Lebanon. Well, it is an absolute nightmare. I really don't know whether there can be a solution. I can only say, look at the Iran-Iraq war in the 80s. It ended not through any magic mediation. A million people killed, both sides exhausted, and then they negotiate. And uh, in Syria, there are no two sides. In Iraq, you have Iraq and Iran. Uh, Syria, even more complicated, more than 100 armed groups. Then you have Assad. So uh, again, I say, when you have a Kofi Annan, Lakdar Brahimi fail, well, the only chance, third alternative, ask Papa Francisco <laughs> to maybe to try. Yes. After <laughs> Kofi Annan and Brahimi, no one else. Um, and what about also the fact that most of the conflicts today, is, today are happening into the border, inside the countries? Because you said Iran and Iraq was very easy, two countries fighting against each yeah, other. Easy. Uh, I mean... Yeah. <laughs> you have two sides, very... Two, two very... Organized states, uh, but uh, it's not like, you know... Uh, sorry, <laughs> organized states, but not... Uh, uh, dozens of insurgents on uh, both either side, yes. So the, the conflicts now have the tendency to be inside the, the, the borders. So that's the reason why we have so, so many IDPs, internal uh, displaced people. So is it a problem now also to find a solution when it, it happened inside the country? Because we have communities, we see it in, in, the, in the world as often uh, problems between communities and, unfortunately, religious co communities? Well, I, uh, I'm afraid, uh, I have to say, when you look at the hundreds of thousands of people in Syria uh, affected by this, and uh, I can judge experience of my country, it's much smaller, 1.2 million, at the end of the war, even less, how difficult it was to get people together to heal the wounds. And the people still traumatized. We managed to constrain them from uh, react on their emotions. Uh, but to heal uh, the wounds of the soul is much more complex. And any moment, things can uh, blow up when you have a, a traumatized people. Now, multiply this a thousand times, a hundred thousand times to Syria. Whole generation of children, young people, growing up, witnessing the horrors of what was done to their families. And uh, I have to say, they are, maybe they are wrong, but disillusion with the West, and people find a scapegoat, find someone to blame. That the Americans, the Europeans, the UN didn't come to help them. So I'm afraid the next months, years to come, we will have uh, some very difficult, dangerous situation resulting from this war in Syria. So. We, 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 we're going to end on another, another point. I think that we're, talking, we're going to talk about a positive point before giving the floor to, to the room, uh, to questions. I mean, you succeeded apparently the, the, your mission in Guinea-Bissau. The second tour of the presidential elections are going to take place this Sunday. And uh, this is a good example of, of peace building. Okay, but uh, I have to be... Uh, 
honest and uh, humble to say that well uh, we have only succeeded half in the sense we have uh, uh, helped the people there to go through this constitutional process back to elections and hopefully in june inaugurating a new government the new uh, national assembly will be inaugurated latest by 23rd may and soon after the new president under the calendar of the constitution and early in june but then comes what i have uh, uh, advocated from day one since i arrived after the elections comes the second phase of the effort to help Guinea Bissau, and that is the rebuilding of the state institutions. In Timor Leste, the UN was there from the end of 99 to 2002, and because of that very short mandate, yes, Sergio Vieira de Melo, Kofi Annan, the international community managed to have a, a minimally functioning state. But it has taken us now 10 years, and we are still uh, improving, strengthening the system. In Guinea-Bissau, the past 40 years, political leaders, military did a very good job in dismantling the state. It, if we want to prevent other crises from occurring a year from now, the international community has to re-engage Guinea-Bissau in a creative way, but also sort of intrusive way, collocating experts in key ministries to do double function, to immediately control corruption, but also to set up modern financial, uh, new modern financial management systems and the training the personnel. And I say intrusive, why? If you put an international advisor in a ministry without powers, well, he'll be sitting at a corner, he will write reports. If the minister is involved in corruption, they will uh, ignore the international advisor. He will keep writing his report, and he, if he annoys the minister too much, they get him transferred somewhere. <laughs> so, and we know that about my own country, I have to confess. Some of our ministers don't like so much an international advisor because he was a bit opinionated. Well, you start bad-mouthing him, and then somehow he gets removed. It happens all the time. Guinea-Bissau, corruption, entrenched throughout the state, everywhere. The new prime minister is a very good, decent man. No one says anything wrong about him. But he will be doomed if the international community doesn't step in and negotiate very tough conditions with him so that he can impose. Because the moment he comes up with this program of rebuilding the state in this forceful manner, immediately patriotism gain new life in Guinea-Bissau. Those involved in corruption, they start invoking Amilcar Cabral. They start saying, this is infringement on our sovereignty. So that's why I say the second phase is going to be tough. But I believe the people of Guinea-Bissau, they vote in an overwhelming way as never before. A clear message to political and military leaders. And I just hope that the international community will do its part. The people pushing by us to some extent, not entirely because they want the change. They have done this in a, acting in an exemplary manner. I have to say, I was impressed. My Timorese colleagues, competitors who were helping the election, they were with me walking in the street of Bissau, seeing thousands of people from pages say at one end of the street. Then 200 meters away, the opposition, thousands of them, and they were not even arguing with each other. They were not fighting. And we're commenting to our, each other. Well, if it was in our country, bottles would start flying. <laughs> and, and then from bottles, you move to pebbles, to rocks. And then total chaos. In Guinea-Bissau, extraordinary <laughs> civility. What the international community will do? Fail them? Fail in our pledges, in our promises? Well, I would say this is for me becoming a moral 
ethical issue to help those people. And uh, I, doubt, I don't know whether the international community will deliver on Guinea-Bissau. We hope so. So um, now we are taking questions, so please identify yourself before uh, asking your question. Uh, questions in English or French, en français, ou en anglais, et uh, si vous pouvez avoir la gentillesse de vous présenter. Des questions, s'il vous plaît seulement. So the gentleman here uh, in the middle, he was the first one to raise his hand. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Suki Hasegawa. I had an opportunity to work with, uh, I call him president, Jose Ramos Horta, when he was a prime minister in the East Timor. And uh, I wish to commend so much the uh, leadership quality of Timor-Leste. Now I have uh, two simple questions. F first one is how you see the outcome of the elections in Guinea-Bissau in the two days. Is there any prospect for the power, pro power struggle that you mentioned the greed for power and the insatiable sort of desire for more wealth on a personal basis? Now, in the Timor-Leste, Vera de Mero laid the foundation and you took off well. But there was a summer uh, power struggle culminating in 2006. How do you possibly suggest to uh, prevent that? Second question is, I understand that the uh, Prime Minister in the Timor-Leste, Shanana Gusmao, has uh, declared that he's going to retire. What is uh, your, again, the views on that, can uh, Timor-Leste continue to manage itself well after his retirement? Thank you. Uh, I start with the second uh, question. Yes, Prime Minister Shanana Guzman will leave office by September. And that is a deliberate uh, policy decision by all of us, by Shanana, myself, Marie Alcatiri, former Prime Minister, leader of the opposition, and uh, Francisco Luolo Guterres, former Speaker of the National Parliament. We are relatively young, full of uh, energy. Shanana is 60-something, I'm 44. <laughs> <laughs> Alcatiri is much older than me, etc. Uh, but we decide that if we really want uh, the new generation uh, to take over, we cannot wait till we are on wheelchairs and then, you know, with a saliva around your uh, mouth and... Uh, well. <laughs> so, no, we have to prepare transition and now. So... All of us make a commitment. We are no longer running for public office. There will be a constitutional amendment to create a body, maybe called Transitional Council, where the founding fathers of the country will be, lasting maybe five, ten years, maximum ten, and where our role, among others, advisory, will be having some uh, real power on certain issues, security defense agreements, international loans, major investments, it have to come to us for signing before it goes to the parliament. This protects the new government because if something goes wrong, they say, well, they agree with it, they sign it. So who are liable? Us, not the new, the younger generation. And then it goes to the parliament. The parliament still have a chance. The parliament can also overrule our, ourselves. But it wouldn't go to parliament uh, anyway if we uh, uh, strongly uh, object. Protect the country. So uh, in five, ten years, hopefully, uh, they are self-confident. 
we have many more people. So that's a unique experiment that uh, we are trying to do. In Guinea-Bissau, what the experience I share with them, which is similar in many countries, we don't really reinvent the wheel. I told them simply, as soon as I arrive, because I know Guinea-Bissau reasonably well from the past. Next elections, brothers and sisters, there cannot be winner takes all, as in the past. Because of your experience, the, the multi-ethnic, multicultural uh, nature of the country. Because we know from the past, one party wins and the other, because they are ostracized, they are treated like second-class citizens, they try to undermine who is in power. And because the condition of guinea are such, it really requires some unity government. And in the beginning, Page SA wouldn't and you can see from the body language, they're extremely polite. Bissau Guineans, they are the most charming people on this planet. You talk with uh, someone, <laughs> if you know the person, you would say, wow, but he's not so bad. Not what people tell about him. <laughs> because each and every one of them are consummate diplomats. I used to say, o guineense seduce e engana meio mundo. They seduce and they dis mislead half of the world. So, but you can re see in their body language that PHSA was not very enthusiastic about my proposal. But then, my more recent conversation with Prime Minister-elect Domingo Simons Pereira, last week I asked him, how are the negotiations ongoing with, for forming the government? We thought it was going to be problematic, but he said, going very well. Uh, we will have a few independent individuals. I have already approached PRS, the second largest party, to see how we can cooperate. So uh, I think in that regard, the military, always a question mark. I have had numerous uh, meetings uh, with them, uh, countless meetings, sometimes with a larger group, sometimes one on one, uh, etc. And uh, my last meeting, I came out, I told my staff and others, I say, after so many meetings with General Antonio Benjai, today I can say I'm certain 99.9% .9 that they will honor the election result no matter. But you always have to reserve that 0.1%. <laughs> but at the same time, we take precautions. The precautions are... ECOWAS leaders are very clear, determined in their message to the leaders there, on all sides, including the military. For the election, we had more than 500 observers. When we began to try to create interest in senior observers, the European Union was uninterested. Hardly anyone, CPLP, didn't know whether it could. And, uh, well, it was a great success. Four former presidents, uh, prime minister, foreign ministers were there. So uh, that sent a clear message to everyone that uh, the elections, no matter the result, have to be honored. And so far, the second round last this Sunday, but as I can say, uh, the, a government will be installed very likely in June. Then what after that? The challenge to rebuild the state for instance, by June, July, we have to find for them, I don't know, 50 million, 100 million dollars to pay school teachers, health workers, food stock, medical stock, etc., etc., from June till uh, December. Are we going to be able to find that money? I believe so. If the European Union Central Bank can find IMF $14 billion overnight to lend to Ukraine. If in the US, in Europe, you can find tens of billions of dollars to rescue auto industries, to rescue failed European American banks by the tens of billions, can't we find $50, $100 million for Guinea-Bissau? 
should be an easy job. So, uh, the lady with the pink scarf. Uh, thank you very much for this conference. Uh, I am Maima. I'm coming from Western Sahara. Um, Mr. Horta uh, asked Pedro Leite, your friend, Pedro Leite, you know him. Uh, Pedro Leite, he said that Timor del Este and Western Sahara, they are like two drops of water. So they are very similar, they are the same. I want to know, Mr. Horta, what is your advice to the young people of Western Sahara who are losing their faith in the peace process that is taking more than 22 years by United Nations to find a solution for this conflict of Western Sahara? They are losing their hope and they are thinking that the violence is the only way to find a solution for this conflict. <clears throat> Well, um, you asked for uh, advice. Um, I don't know whether I could give uh, advice to a great people who have been in this situation, struggle for uh, uh, 40 years uh, uh, now. It's like giving advice to the Palestinians who have been in the struggle for 60 years. So um, I feel... Uh, a bit uh, troubled by that, but um, uh, when did I have a hope that Timor would be free? It was here in Geneva once, not uh, really in Geneva, was in Lyon. Whenever I came to Geneva, either I would stay in some of the most run down cheapest uh, hotels, you pay 10 francs for a room, but you have to share shower with a lot of uh, brothers from different parts of the world. <laughs> and uh, later I met some friends, Swiss friends, I stayed in Lyon. Driving one morning to Geneva to attend one of those endless futile sessions of the Human Rights Commission, <laughs> and uh, where you heard uh, uh, lectures from uh, one-party systems about uh, democracy and human rights, uh, suddenly I always tune in to BBC, loyally. Uh, eight in the morning, I tune in to BBC. The news came about this, a Soviet cosmonaut, Captain Nikolai, doesn't say anything because a lot of people in Russia, they call Nikolai. I don't remember his surname. <laughs> he was a cosmonaut. He had gone into space many months earlier. At the end of the mission in space, he was preparing the spacecraft to return to Earth. From Moscow, they told him, don't come back. Your country no longer exists. They said, circle the earth a few more times until you figure out what to do. <laughs> yeah. In the end, he landed, I think, in Kazakhstan. And uh, <laughs> the empire no longer existed. And I sat there. And uh, first, I had tremendous sympathy for the Soviet cosmonaut. I said, God, the most lonely person in the universe. Only then I thought about what will happen now. Well, there are no impossibilities if we stay focused, but never surrender to desperation that lead to violence, because then you self-destruct. I tell you one thing, ladies and gentlemen. Among Timorese, particularly in Civil War 75, we kill each other. 75 till 77, we had a lot of internal problems, and many people died, not in the hands of Indonesia. But from day one of our struggle till 99, not a single Indonesian civilian was abducted or killed by the Timorese resistance. Every Indonesian soldier captured after a few months in the mountains were returned. Not a single Indonesian soldier captured by the Timorese resistance that was unaccounted for. 
The only thing unaccounted for was his uniform and his shoes. They were sent back. If ever we were to follow the experience of some others, we would not be free today, I guarantee. We would be complete. We were already isolated. We would have been even more isolated. We won the struggle partly because of all public opinion. All over the world. Antonio Guterres, I can tell you, I hope I can share a confidence, but that tells about your greatness. He was Prime Minister of Portugal. He managed to speak to Bill Clinton over the phone. He told Bill Clinton, I cannot hold back my people. Hundreds of thousands of people demonstrating in Portugal against the violence. If you don't join us to get the UN to do something, we will have to leave Bosnia, Kosovo. And maybe we leave NATO. Of course, Bill Clinton didn't need that incentive. But that shows the emotions, not only in Portugal, but in many countries. A small people, we only then 800,000, forgotten in the Far East. We are at the edge of the wall. We are really at the edge of the wall. If you go to Timor-Leste, if you're not careful, you walk over, you fall into the darkness. We were really at the edge of the wall. <laughs> and uh, yet, millions of people all over the world came to our rescue. The Security Council acted in the fastest possible manner. And that partly because we never embark on gratuitous violence against anyone. Not a single Indonesian school teacher, farmer, peasant, bicycle repair person, and today, we have thousands of Indonesians still in Timor-Leste, not a single incident involving Indonesians who are there. The relationship between Timor-Leste and Indonesia are the best in the region. No two countries in Asia have better relations than Timor and Indonesia. At government level and people to people level. So uh, that's all I can say. Focus, don't lose weight, well, hope but never surrender to desperation and violence. So, sir? Serge Vergniaud, uh, nous avons eu le plaisir et j'ai eu le privilège de travailler avec vous sous la, le, le leadership de Sergio de Mello uh, lorsque les Nations Unies administraient le territoire avant l'indépendance de Timor. Et j'étais en charge de l'agriculture, de la forêt et de la pêche et j'ai en mémoire, dans les réunions que nous avions, lorsque je défendais mon budget pour l'agriculture, il était ridiculement bas en comparaison des autres budgets. Euh, notamment, on s'intéressait surtout au processus soi-disant démocratique et à, à la sécurité. J'ai revécu la même situation en Afghanistan, tout de suite après Timor. Et donc, ma question est la suivante. Est-ce que vous ne pensez pas qu'après un conflit... Euh, il y a une opportunité très courte euh, pour véritablement ramener la paix et que si on se concentrait surtout sur les besoins des populations, euh, sur le développement social et le développement économique, plutôt que le processus démocratique, les choses avanceraient de meilleure façon. Euh, suite euh, au conflit à Timor à, à 99, il y a une euh, dimension humanitaire euh, du problème. Il y avait des milliers, des centaines de milliers de réfugiés, de déplacés, soit à Timor même, soit en Indonésie. L'agriculture était abandonnée à cause du conflit depuis des mois. Euh, de, L'incertitude de la situation depuis euh, le, la chute, le renversement euh, du président Suarto. On ne savait qu'est-ce qui va passer. Alors, euh, des ressortissants indonésiens, citoyens indonésiens à Timor, 
ont quitté, sont quittés du pays. Et il y avait les conflits de mois d'août et septembre. Alors tout était détruit. Et on craignait à ce moment-là qu'il y aurait une situation humanitaire catastrophique. Mais ça, Sergio et autres a pu éviter. On parle pas souvent de cette partie, euh, aspect du problème, que les Nations Unies, et surtout les agences humanitaires, se mobilisaient bien et pour éviter euh, une crise humanitaire suite à la sortie de l'Indonésie, l'arrivée des forces internationales. Alors, ça, c'était une priorité de la part des communautés internationales. Comment éviter une situation humanitaire Mais pour euh, consolider la situation sécuritaire, il faut une force crédible. Et via Interfet, la mobilisation de la communauté internationale, on avait sur place à Timor très vite euh, 8000 euh, militaires euh, armés. Euh, autorisé par le Conseil de sécurité, chapitre 7, pour dissuader n'importe qui, euh, surtout les milices armées euh, soutenues par l'Indonésie à ce moment-là. Après ça, on arrive à 2002, euh, à 2000, euh, commencer les efforts pour, de la part de Serge ou des Nations Unies de commencer à construire l'État à partir d'air absolument rien. Et nous n'avons pas des gens de timorais euh, euh, préparés avec d'expérience pour l'administration publique. Et les conseils de sécurité avaient dit deux ans pour construire l'État. Après euh, la fin de la mission, la sortie de Sergio et de Untaet, Timor indépendant, vous savez combien était notre budget annuel à 2002-2003 À peu près euh, 50 millions de dollars. Aujourd'hui, notre budget annuel, c'est un billion et quelque chose. Et ça, c'est euh, à 100% euh, provenant euh, du euh, Petroleum Fund euh, de Timor, le euh, Fundo Soberano, Sovereign Fund euh, de Timor de l'Est. Alors, on a pu investir dans un projet d'électrification moderne par tous les pays, c'est complété, fini, 80% de la population a accès à l'électricité, 24 heures sur 24 heures, et on a commencé les grands projets d'infrastructure, de moderniser les routes, euh, etc., plus d'investissement dans des secteurs agricoles, formation technique, on a payé par Timor notre budget, plus de peut-être deux centaines des étudiants aux Philippines, plus d'une centaine en Thaïlande, 300 plus ou moins en Australie, moitié moitié par Timorais par payé pour les Australiens, au Brésil et plus, euh, environ 200, je crois que ça c'est à tout entière payé par les Brésiliens, euh, au Portugal euh, des centaines, une part payée par nous. Alors, le gouvernement a décidé d'investir sérieusement dans la formation humaine. Pas seulement de faire des petites courses universitaires, mais vraiment master's degrees, administration publique, euh, géologie, euh, pétrole, etc. Euh, en Singapour, partout, au Japon, en Corée du Sud, pour que nous savons euh, les, les plus importants investissements pour nous, c'est dans la formation humaine, la formation technique. On a investi plus dans l'agriculture avec le, la, le soutien du Japon et de la Chine pour moderniser l'agriculture. Merci. Euh, encore quelques... Le jeune homme juste là. Oui, voilà. Merci. Ce sont les dernières questions. 
Um, hello, my name is Carlos Garcia. I come from Colombia. Um, I want to make two small questions, one related to my country. Uh, Colombia currently, the government of Colombia is currently holding talks with the rebels uh, for, in, for achieving finally peace. And it's likely that there will be an, a, a stage of post-conflict in a couple of years. My question has to do with the, with the subject of reparations to the victims and the measures that have been taken regarding the, the confessions of what happened during the civil conflict. And another issue will be the rejection that the Colombian population has to conduct in these peace talks. Some of the people of Colombia want to continue the military effort until the final defeat of the, of the rebels. Um, and my second question has to do with uh, something you said about Ukraine and Syria, and probably I'm going to include in this group Georgia. You talked about the, what, what happened, what we could see about the geopolitical objectives of other countries in, in these small nations. And this is, well, a scenario that belonged to the, to the Cold War. My question is, what can these small countries do to assure peace when in reality, they have little to none influence to what is happening on a higher stage of international relations. For example, the Georgians probably didn't like the war with the Russians at all, and there won't be a conflict in Ukraine if there was, if no interest of Russia or the European Union exists at all. So what can small countries do to avoid conflicts that happened during the, 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 the 20th century, the Korean War and Vietnam War? Well, we're related to the interests of, uh, of, of the superpowers of the moment. So what can do these small nations do? So that's a good question. Thank you. On the first uh, uh, question, I uh, lost uh, contact uh, with Colombia more than 10 years ago. I, uh, many of you, are, well, probably no, no one knows that I was in Colombia in 98, I was asked by UNICEF through fans in uh, Colombia to negotiate with ELN, Ejército de Liberación Nacional, there are two, FARC and ELN, release of 15 youth hostages taken by ELN. To make the story short, I managed to seek their release completely, all 15 flown out to, from where we were into freedom without paying any ransom. Uh, since then, and I went back once more, I think, but I never uh, went back, so I'm not very familiar. What I can say is the experience in Timor Leste and what I advise in Guinea-Bissau in the reconciliation process. You know, each country, we have to have our own model of uh, reconciliation based on our own experience. Uh, South Africa was one, Timor Leste, we had two. A National Reconciliation Commission, and then we had a unique experience anywhere in the world, uh, binational, Timor Leste and Indonesia. Because our conflict was not only internal. We did have internal problems, but we, the bigger problem was with an external power, Indonesia. So we had to have a two-track reconciliation approach. First among Timorese, it went on for four years. Very successful, but again, like in the reconciliation process, it has to be ongoing. More than 100 recommendations came out of it. Then we established one with Indonesia. It was myself and current president of Indonesia, Susil Bambang Widyonu. We set up, we appointed five or five of each side, independent individuals, to look at our joint history. Initially, even the UN was skeptical and didn't want to contribute. Uh, in the end, their report was credible enough and was accepted. But there has to be always an element of uh, asking for forgiveness, uh, telling the truth, and uh, compensation to the victims. In our case, we said we are not going to demand from the other side to they look after their victims, we look after ours. And uh, we set up compensation 
for uh, the victims. First, you start with recognition of the victims. And then you set up all forms of arrangements to help the victims, their families, uh, widows, orphans, etc. In Guinea-Bissau, I advise to go through their own model of possible model of conciliation process, but I said, do not forget a compensation mechanism for those who are alive, whose parents or what other relatives were killed in the course of their history. The second one is very long. I already made reference uh, to it, so if you forgive me, I abstain from uh, commenting further on the second question. Thank you very much.